And especially when you have a big Zoa garden, they have a tendency to release toxin. Uh, as a result, a lot of people recommend actually running. Hey, what's up, Reefers? For the last four or so weeks, I've been having issue with frog spawn. Not just in the 10 gallon tank, but also downstairs in the 20 gallon mangrove tank. They are simply not as puffy as before, and I could not figure out why. I thought it was odd because if it's just one system, okay, but it's actually both systems, the same coral behaving the same way. So I started going down the list, and one of the things I did last week was to replace all the filters in the RDI system to make sure all the water is on the up and up. But since then, I've done a water change, and things did not really improve. In fact, I feel like it's getting a little bit worse. So I started to look a little bit deeper. Now keep in mind that this same thing is happening to both tanks who it's not connected. It's two separate systems. So next thing I want to check is the salt mix. You see here, I got my three options in terms of testing salinity or specific gravity here. We got the Hannah checker that I've been using. We got the refractometer that I've not used in a long time. And we got the swing arm uh, meter that I've been using for a long time, but have not used for a while. Now, the interesting thing is today I brought this out I tested the water it is a little bit saltier than expected it was measuring at 1.027 I was aiming for 1.026 or sometimes 1.025 so the Hannah checker is slightly out of calibration for me and to be completely honest I have not calibrated this for quite a few months so today we're going to recalibrate it double check it with the Hannah checker with the swing arm and also with the refractometers now with the refractometer I do have to calibrate again because I have not done that in a while and the important with these calibration fluids is that they need to be sitting at around 70 70 degrees for it to be accurate so for that we're just going to drop this in the tank to float it for a while to make sure the temperature is up to par. In terms of calibrating the Hannah Checker salinity tester, I do also have some of these uh, calibration fluid as well. Since the Hannah Checker is actually temperature compensated, I don't think I need to actually bring this up to room temp, but just out of good practice, I do like to float that as well. All right, so I've actually set the tester here for quite a bit. Just for record's sake, uh, doing a test right now is now sitting at 1.024. It actually may be too low. Uh, temperature is 78. Um, so what I want here is actually knowing the temperature of the tank. It's sitting at 78. I did a water change today and really kind of like brought the salinity down. Maybe a little bit too low. So for comparison's sake, a little bit later on, right now sitting at 1.024 at 78.1 degrees. All right, I'm gonna recalibrate the Hannah checker right now. All right, here's my super messy work table. Um, here's the standard. Let me open that up and put it in the cup. Man, it's tough doing this by myself. I'm like kind of clenching it between my thighs. I do not want to hold it in my hand because I don't want it to heat up the solution. And then we'll go into calibration. Use 35 PPT solution. Jam this guy in there and it should auto detect. and it's recording right now. Ideally, um, I should be recalibrating this tester uh, monthly. I think the last time I did this is probably, man, maybe like half a year? I think at least at least six, at least six months. Because it's been so long, it's mostly out of calibration. So right now it's probably reset to 35 PPM at 1.026 specific gravity. All right, so I think we're all set. That was quick. I'm gonna just gonna rinse it here. I just want to see if it makes any difference. So now it's showing 1.026 instead of 1.024. You know what? So my tank was, yeah, it was high because it was showing 1.026 before. So it's probably sitting at 1.028 or something like that uh, before I did the water tank this morning. And that's why probably the corals were all pissed off. Well, not all the corals, the frog spine mainly. Everything else seems okay, but his frost not looking a little off. But anyways, let's let's um verify this number. Uh, it's actually dropping to 1.025 now. Now the temperature is compensated to 7 78.2. So this is probably where I want to sit. I like 1.025 and 1.026. But let's go ahead and uh, recalibrate the refractometer as well. All right, so I got this refractometer from, I think, Amazon. And it has ATC, meaning that it has auto temperature calibration. At least it should, but we'll see. We're going to go ahead and add about two or three jobs of the tank water on here. We're gonna slap this down, make sure there's no air, and then we're gonna let it sit for a little bit first. Um, so a lot of people just right away start looking at it, but in order for the um, auto temperature conversation to kick in, you gotta kinda let it sit for a little bit. So we're gonna let it, let it rest, and then we're gonna take a look at the value. Moments later. All right, it's set for a while. Let me see if we can show you guys uh, right here. 
is sitting at 1.025. This is without calibration. So now we're gonna calibrate it with the calibration fluid and then we'll try it again. For the calibration fluid, I'm using the Aquacraft product. Uh, this is really popular on Amazon and a lot of people seem to use this one. A lot of companies like Two Little Fishies also they have their own calibration solution. Uh, I feel like they all work, they're all standard and they should all measure at 35 PBT. So let's do a couple drops. I'm gonna slap this close again. Once again, we're gonna give it a little time to compensate for the temperature. Okay, I think now we're good. We're sitting at 35 PPT and 1.026. Uh, at least as close as I could get it to. Uh, so now we're gonna once again try with the tank water to see where we're sitting at. All right, so from what I see, it looks almost like it's 1.026 or 027. Uh, so it's like a hair, let me see. It's like a hair above 35 ppt. I'll call it like 35.5, but it looks like 1.026 or 1.027, uh, which is 1.001 more than the uh, Hannah Checker. I'm keeping that in there as well. Uh, so we kind of needed to type, I feel like it's close enough, but I kind of want to get the value from the swing arm, as, from a swing arm as well, just to see where it's sitting at. So let's go back to the most basic tool. So swing arm hydrometer has a really bad wraps, but they all vary so much, even between the same brand. I feel like I happen to have a really reliable one. This is from the Instant Ocean, treated me really well. As long as I don't get any bubble caught under the swing arm, I like to shake it, knock it against a little, knock it against the glass a little bit. I usually get really consistent result from it. And I like to maybe rinse it once or twice. I mean, I've done this earlier today, so there shouldn't be any like dried up salts, but just in case, let's rinse it. I've used this for four or five years. Um, I think like between all the different test kit or tools I have, I like the hand checker the most uh, because I also get the temp from it and it's really easy to use. I actually like the swing arm more than a refractometer, at least this particular one, simply because um, I'm so comfortable using it and just so easy. It has been really consistent for me. Oh man, making a mess. This is a hair about 1.026. All right, it's interesting. Uh, so this is telling me that it's at 36 PPT for salinity and 1.027 for specific gravity. I think it's really close to the refractometer. I'm gonna just double check it with the Hannah checker. It's 1.025. All right, well, so the big question is now, who do you believe we bought? We got 1.025 on the Hannah checker, showing me 78.6 degrees or five. Um, we got the swing arm telling me that it's 1.027 maybe it's 0.02 it's 0.002 difference and we got the refractometer that's kind of sitting in between them saying that it's 1.026 boy <laughs> I don't know guys. Now I'm gonna take the water to probably local reefers or fish store just to check, just so that I can really get a second opinion. But in the meantime, I think I'm gonna bring it down by 0.001, because assuming the henna is right, running a reef tank at 1.024, it's no big deal, that's fine. However, if the swing arm is right and it's sitting at 1.027, that's a little bit too high. So just bring down a notch to 1.026, um, according to the swing arm, it's, it's good for reef tank. So it's tiny little tweak, that may not even be it, but I'll feel a little better. So uh, I'm just gonna pull some salt water out, put some fresh water in, and we'll call it a day and see how things react. It's always something with a reef tank, right? Check out this hair. Moments later. Well, the other thing I suspect could be alkalinity swing because I'm not really dosing in both tanks. So I wonder if something have to do with alkal calcium. So we're gonna do a alkalinity test in this tank. Uh, the only thing that's kind of keeping me of saying, oh, it's elk swings because the kryptonite candy cane, which is also LPS, is doing really well. Um, so I'm just rinsing a test tube here. So I've already added the reagent and we're gonna take a look at the final results. Um, 6.5, that's fine. I think it was sitting at around this value before, so it didn't swing much. Um, the reason I thought it could be elk is because I tried dose, hand dosing some of the ATI Coral Essential. Uh, without using a dosing pump. So it's not too consistent, but 6.5 is, I feel like that's kind of around where the tank sits naturally anyway. So I think this is okay. So it probably is not due to elk. The next morning. So yesterday we checked salinity and it was not too far off. So that may not be it. So to continue the investigation on what is going on with these frog spawns, 
Today I'm gonna test uh, nitrate, nitrate and phosphate actually. Um, in terms of nitrate, my favorite go-to at the moment is the NIOS nitrate kits. I also have the Red Sea Nitrate Pro that takes a lot longer to test. So for um, the more general testing, usually I use the NIOS kits. So the nitrate is sitting at three, which is a totally acceptable range. And actually I prefer detectable nitrate. So nitrate being three is probably not the issue for this tank. Um, right now I'm waiting for the phosphate test. Maybe that'll tell something as well. Okay, phosphate test is wrapping up. We got about 10 seconds left to go. I'm expecting the phosphate to probably be zero uh, because I'm running pretty aggressive GFO in the handleback filter, but let's see what it actually is. Um, again, nitrate is three. Phosphate, zero, as I was expecting because GFO is probably stripping all the phosphate up from this tank. So nitrate is not an issue, phosphate is not an issue. Ideally, that should be detectable level of uh, phosphate in this tank, I wonder, if that plays a factor, I, but I don't think uh, zero phosphate would cause frog spawn to really close up like this. But you know what? Let's dose a little bit of liquid phosphate just so that they're not sitting at zero, um, even though they may get absorbed by the GFO, but at least we get a little bit of a spike. Let me just see how the corals react to the additional phosphate. Maybe I have to pull some GFO out if the lack of phosphate is really an issue, but I'm not sure. I don't think frog spawn will really close up like that with the lack of phosphate. To raise phosphate, I'm going to use uh, Fisher Hacks uh, PO4. Direction causal point 0.5 millimeter per 25 gallon. I'm gonna do a 0.25 and then we'll see what's going on. Three days later. Dose phosphate twice back to back on two days. Uh, a moderate amount, just so that I can kind of see if there's any reaction from the corals. They look roughly the same. Now, if you just look at it, you may be like, oh, okay, it looks okay. But if you look back a couple months to how the frog spawn used to look, it's totally different. It's puffed up, takes up totally like two thirds of the tank. So something is happening. I'm gonna send out an ICP test just to double check all the values. Uh, nitrate at three ppm, I think it's um, totally acceptable. Actually, it's a good range. Phosphate zero, as I mentioned, added some phosphate, did not really notice too much of a change. Uh, salinity, temperature, all looks right. So the next thing I'm suspecting is possibly coral warfare, chemical warfare, namely from the Zoas. So as you guys know, I edited all these Zoa colony maybe like three or four months ago. I mean, probably three, two and a half, three months actually. It's not, hasn't been that long. So I feel like now is about the time that the Zoa is really settling the tank and kind of claiming it as his own. One of the things that they do is possibly releasing toxin, especially when you have a big Zoa garden. They have a tendency to release toxin. Uh, as a result, a lot of people recommend actually running um, carbon, which I do not have in this tank. I only have um, a little bag of uh, GFO to, for the phosphate control. So what I'm gonna do now is actually putting some carbon into the HOB as well to hang on the back filter. I got a nice little mash bag and then uh, some carbon from Polyp Lab. In terms of activated carbons, I feel like most of them are pretty similar. Uh, there are certain ones like from ChemiClean that claims to be a lot cleaner, meaning you just run, rinse it once or twice, you're good to go. Uh, the other ones you may have to rinse a couple more times, but for the most part, I feel like carbon uh, is carbon. <laughs> I know a lot of people, they typically just run a bag of carbon. They always have a bag of carbon in the sump uh, just for chemical warfare and just something that has to get into the water. But in this case, I figure let's try it out. All right, don't tell Emily I'm using her bathroom. It's gonna kill me. But her bathroom happens to be right next to my um, office where the 10 gallon budget nano tank is. So more convenient. I'm holding the camera with my armpits, it works. You get a nice first person view too. So let's go ahead and, problem with carbon is that they exhaust pretty quickly. Um, usually about, I'll say three weeks, two weeks, three weeks. Well, it depends on how bad the water is. Um, they'll exhaust and you have to you have to kind of pull them out. Interesting thing is that a lot of people like to uh, run carbon and GFO at the same time. You put them together in the same container or the same media chamber. You want to make sure that the water doesn't tumble them too badly because the um, I believe the carbon is well number one the carbon is going to grind up the GFO, and number two the um, the carbon is going to exhaust much faster than GFO. For example, GFO may be good for about two or three months and the carbon is exhausted after two weeks. So if you have it all in one, one bag or one chamber, you have to change all of them out. So that's not ideal. Anyways, all right, here's what I mean. Like carbon usually have a little carbon dust and that's why I want to rinse them. Actually a power black one comes up really clean. There's not much going on. You can hear the carbon fizzle. Um, 
Trinket Pot is finding a spot. Small tank. Do I want to move to GFO? Not really. Let me just put it right here. So the tricky part is to make sure the water get forced through the media. And that's why a media reactor is so effective because the water is being pushed through the media versus like in cases like this, if there's an easier way, the water's gonna go that route. At least most of the water's gonna go that route and it'll, it'll go around the media. But I'm hoping that, um, yeah, it should be okay. I'm, I'm covering enough surface area that even if some of the media gets flows around, I still get, I still get some coverage from the, um, active carbon right there. All right, so we're gonna leave this running. Looking at this setup right now, one other thing that's slightly worrying me is actually right here. Um, this is the Aqua Knight mount, and that's a part that's underwater. I didn't even notice before, it looks like it turned white. It's, I'm not sure what's happening. Uh, we'll take a closer look when this light out, and um, obviously we're gonna send an ICP test in if there's like metal or whatnot, and then we'll start see, we'll see what's going on here. The next day. Good morning, guys. Today I prepared the ICP test from ATI to be sent out to get analyzed. In terms of ICP tests, I really like the ATI brand ones because they also test your our source water, and not to mention the way they present the results is really clear, really easy to understand, and also they have really solid actionable recommendation that you can follow. Um, anyways, we're gonna send this in. Um, the only downside to ATI is that I believe they send it back to Germany so it takes a while it's not like some of the other ICP tests within the states that you get a result really quickly so maybe a week and a half or two weeks before I hear back but chances are by the time I get the ICP test back uh, whatever issue we have with the tank most likely is already resolved uh, if not then we have something else going on maybe this this guy right here I'm really looking at this this metal mount is uh, discolored so I want to see if this metal in the tank uh, specifically and then we'll, we'll, we'll deal with it three days later Hey guys, I messed up. <laughs> How do I begin? All right, first of all, it has been about three days since I started running carbon, and I've also done a water change on the same day, and I feel like the frost bond is looking about the same. Not, not as bad, but not great as well. And while I was messing with the carbon, I also messed with the flow of the hang on the back filter as well. Before the filter was running on the lowest setting, I kind of crank up a little bit because I want a little bit higher flow. The main reason is for the King Midas Zoas. Before it was really closed up, and then I got a tip saying that King Midas in particular really enjoy higher flow. I had it over here before and it was mostly closed up. I moved it here, cranked up the flow, and sure enough, look at that, they are back open. So different Zoas definitely prefer different kind of maybe water chemistry or even flow or even light. And we probably shouldn't lump them all into the same category in terms of preferences. Where I messed up is that as I crank up the flow to the hang on the back filter, the water level rise in the back, especially since now we got some blockage with the carbon bag. And right here is a water hose for the fresh water to come in as water evaporate. I think some of you guys may know where this is going. But what ended up happening for one day while I was at work was this. Basically, as the water uh, evaporates, fresh water get pumped in, but when the pump stops, it creates a siphon because I do not have a siphon, siphon break on the fresh water tube and it started pulling tank water out into the ATO container, which contained fresh water. And as the water got lower, it, it stopped pushing fresh water in here again. So it's like a cycle where salt water got pulled out from the tank into the container, container pump fresh water into the tank. Into the tank. So really what ended up happening is that is linking the ATO container, which contained maybe like three gallon of fresh water with the 10 gallon tank and it dilute the whole tank. So when I came back that day, the coral did not look any worse, uh, but I noticed that for some reason, the ATO kept pumping water out. I'm like, what's going on? Tested the salinity, it was sitting at 1.021. Well, it's not to the point where I started freaking out. However, I started moving the fresh water uh, hose way higher now, um, almost outside of the container. I'll probably have to find a different way to do it. Maybe I'll have some kind of contraption to drop water from the top instead of like this. Where I really messed up was how I raised the salinity of the tank. So what I ended up is using this cup right here, fill it with tank water, and I add maybe a cup of salt in here. And I started a really slow pour once in a while to add water in the overflow compartment, thinking that the water is gonna get nice and mixed up by the time it goes through the whole hang on the back filter. It was working well until I get to near the bottom of the cup. What I did not realize is that near the bottom of the cup, there were some undissolved salts. As uh, so I finished pouring the cup at the end, I was like, oh, it's not wasted. No, 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 no. I actually saw a little bit of salt that kind of flow out with the water. And I was like, oh, no, 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 no. But by that time, it was too late. I saw some of them make contact with the frog spawns, namely the ones that looked really pissed off and pretty much on his way out. 
and it's it's just bad, man. At the time, I'm like smacking myself in the head, like, dude, why do you just do like a water change? And I knew it was bad because if you look at it, right, um, these are fine. These are like clothes are probably pissed off, but like that, those right there, that looks a little, some white fuzzies up there. Those are pretty much peeling or melting, and those are pretty much gone. I can pretty much write those off. The tissue got damaged by the salt. This, my friend, is one of the worst mistakes I've done recently this is totally stupid hindsight i should have just done a water change instead of trying to pour saturated salt water to raise the salinity level uh, so please learn from me don't do this super stupid mistake so looking at this again it looks roughly the same and as promised um now, now that we talked about it let me just show you what i wanted to show you and this piece right here i think it's aluminum um you see that it has a discoloration the whole thing is supposed to be black but down here is totally silver and white. So I don't think that's a good sign. And earlier in the video, you saw that I sent out an ICP test maybe like three days ago. Uh, it'll take me a while to get the results back. So we'll see how it goes. But in the meantime, on top of running carbon, I also just picked up some copper sorb. This will absorb all the copper and also heavy metal. So we kind of, we're gonna fit it in the over... <laughs> I'm so afraid to stick things in the overflow now. Unfortunately, this issue is not something that I can resolve within one video in, in the span of like a week or two. So this is gonna be a work in progress. And I just wanna show you guys my process of elimination of what I think could be wrong with the frog spawn. Um, at this point, since I've carbon running in there and this uh, two water changes already, maybe it's not solely due to Zoas or Pali releasing chemicals in the water. Maybe it's something more. It could be metal. I don't know. We'll see when the ICP test comes out. However, I don't want to wait three weeks until I can do something about it. Um, so I figure I'll put in the copper sorb for now and also run the carbon because these are things that won't hurt a reef tank. If you have it, you don't need it. The water's gonna push through it. That's fine. Maybe you waste the media. But if it happens to be one of these things and um, these fixes works, great but for sure i'll keep you guys posted if you guys want the latest update on this tank make sure to follow me on instagram at inappropriate reefer otherwise i'm sure in i think like maybe two or three weeks i'll probably make another video uh giving you guys an update on this tank see you guys next sunday at 12 30 p.m Bye. but you're at inappropriate reefer's channel so we do our water testing with our odi water